Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this video is titled Aircraft Design Tales from the Dark Side, or Why, in my opinion, Cessna lost the next generation trainer proposal. Now, some of the comments I have here won't be the most appreciated by some of the people in upper management. While I was in Cessna flight test, and since I had been an Air Force instructor pilot, and specifically had been an instructor pilot in the T-37, they wanted me to work on this program. So we had a little going away cake, and uh, yeah, the auto gyro might have had a better chance of uh, succeeding. All right. I was selected to be one of the uh, team leaders. I was in, uh, in charge of the cockpit and escape system. So, okay. Hey, it's kind of cool. Uh, clean sheet of paper, design a brand new aircraft. That sounded like a lot of fun. Wait a minute. This is what it's going to look like? That looks an awful lot like this, which is a T-37. And I'm going, okay, you can't put lipstick on a 25-year-old design and sell it to the Air Force. Let's have some innovation here. Okay, let, let's, let's think beyond the box. You know, let's think outside of the box. Let's come up with some new stuff. Now, a lot had happened. We had much better engines. We had better avionics somewhat. Now, this is in the early days where the um, CRT's LCD displays uh, didn't quite hack it yet. And uh, the ones that were available wouldn't fit in this aircraft, and they didn't think they'd be that reliable because this was kind of a really harsh environment. So we had to, we had to rely on the old round dials. Okay, that's unfortunate, but can't we show a little bit of innovation? Now, this program started in 1981, the Next Generation uh, proposal. The Air Force came out and said, hey, we want people to bid on this. And at first, Cessna higher-up said, nah, we're not interested. And they kind of passed on it. Then they decided, well, this contract could be worth $1 billion. Maybe we should look at that again. So they kind of decided, uh, kind of at the last minute, to put this thing together pretty quickly. So they took a Hangar 10 on the airport, and they threw a whole bunch of desks in their phone, computers, and stuff like that. And, and we got busy on this project. The only trouble with this is we started in the fall and that hangar was not very warm. There were people working with their coats on and people putting in extremely long days. And I put in uh, extremely long days on this. They, they called a, a lot of us next generation trainer widows. Okay. Well, here's our proposal. I'm just going to keep this picture up here for a moment because it, it looked a lot like what our proposal looked like. Now, wait a minute. This is Fairchild's proposal, and, and no, this isn't a drawing. This is actual picture of the aircraft in flight. Well, that's interesting. Um, what Fairchild had done was they had contracted with Ames Industries of Bohemia, New York, to build a flyable 62% vehicle, and Bert Rattan's aircraft factory was going to evaluate it, and uh, Dick Rattan did a lot of the flying. They wanted to validate the proposed aircraft design and its flight and handling characteristics. Hmm, that's really cool. They had a flying prototype. What did we have? We had a picture that looked a lot like a Cessna T-37. Uh, later, I'm going to show you the drawing. Uh, Cessna hired an artist to actually draw what the uh, proposal would look like. It was in color. I only have a black and white picture, but that, that's a, as exciting as we got. And the picture wasn't much bigger than, like, the painting wasn't much bigger than, like, 12 by 12. Well, spoiler alert here. The Fairchild proposal, yeah, it got into some problems. Not so much the pro uh, proposal, but actually what transpired once they tried to go into production. Okay, I was in charge of book five, which was the uh, uh, cockpit and escape system design. Now... Whenever you're writing a proposal, you want to bring in experienced people. And they did that. And they hired uh, supposedly a guy in his team who had a virtually 100% success rate in proposals. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So they give this guy a retainer and a very nice salary. He goes out and buys a brand new silver Porsche, which he parks right in front of the hangar. And uh, comes in, sets down with the secretaries, drinks coffee, and laughs, laughs most of the morning and then leaves in the afternoon. Um, yeah. Uh, 
the old joke at Cessna was if you worked for Cessna, you couldn't afford to buy one of their products. You know how many of us uh, Cessna engineers uh, kind of took just a little offense that this guy who didn't seem to be doing too much of anything uh, was driving around this nice Porsche and laughing with the secretaries while we were working extremely long hours. Now, okay, maybe he earned his money or might have earned his money later on when the uh, proposal finally came together. And they seem to be pretty busy towards the end of this whole adventure. But um, yeah. It didn't work out well. Cessna had a lot of confidence, and, well, that's good. It's always good to have a lot of confidence, but it doesn't necessarily get you what you want. Well, over the years, design criteria for aircraft change. This is my Great Lakes biplane, and it was designed in the 20s. No, not 2020s, 1920s. So, it's a very old design. People were smaller back then, and uh, I have trouble fitting some people in this airplane just because of that. Well, one thing they wanted to do was most Air Force aircraft until that time had been designed to the 95th percentile. That is, you will fit people who come in to the 95th percent of seating height, arm, lay, arm length, uh, leg length, and all this sort of stuff. Well, they decided they wanted to open up the envelope a little bit and design it for the 97th percentile. So they brought this guy in to help me. And he sits down next to me and we start talking and I... I, um, you know, I didn't know or remember actually who Joe Kittinger was, but he was noted for some very high altitude parachute work. So needless to say, we really had some fun, interesting conversations, and I was extremely fortunate to work with such an experienced gentleman. Okay, we're putting the pr proposal together. Uh, it's still round dials. You know, this is what the instructor sees. Uh, we were making improvements. It was going to be pressurized now, which is nice. Um, it was going to have better reach and visibility capabilities. But the biggest improvement is we went from the T-37, which was a 30 millimeter shell that just barely cleared you from the aircraft with one big initial boom, and that was it. No guidance or anything to the ACES-2 ejection seat, which had a zero zero capability, and it had all neat other sequencing stuff and of course the uh, the design of the uh, the cockpit is based on being able to punch yourself out of the aircraft and still keeping important parts of your body like your knees and stuff so you have to clear the gear, glare shield and it became a little more complicated with uh you know the various systems and that nicely improved so we put this together in a book now one thing that's kind of interesting is on the walls of the hangar we had the proposal all written out. All these pages that you you just seen were were up on the wall, and the um, managers would come around and they'd take their pencil and they'd make little changes. And I had this one manager who was it was kind of funny. He was um, micromanaging to the nth degree. I mean, they could make a movie about this guy. And he goes up there and he changes the wording on one of my pages. Okay, fine. So I redo it, put it back up there. He comes back up, he changes it again. And I go, well, that's very interesting. That was my original wording. You know, in any design, there's a lot of trade-offs. And you see, this is the T-tail design, which is what finally came out. And this is the painting. We hired, an, uh, Cessna hired an artist to, uh, to paint this. And uh, uh, this is what we had. They had a flying prototype. We had a painting. But you see the tail here up at the top, T-tail. Well, this tail had gone from uh, a conventional tail at the bottom of the rudder to a cruciform tail, and it would go up and down. And I had a friend who is from a very famous uh, car manufacturing company that's no longer in existence, but he was a ham radio operator like myself, but rather intense individual. And the tail, I, I joke that you should put it on a screw jack because... From one day to the next, it would go from the uh, the T tail to the top to the bottom to mid, and it was always moving around. And one day, I went back and and I saw my friend working on the antenna design, and I said, you know, it's been a T tail for at least a day. And I was serious; it had been a day, T tail for at least a day. And he got irate. He says, "They can't do that." And I go. Oh, the, uh, the antenna location dictates the uh, position of the tail on the vehicle? It sure as heck does. 
and he slammed his fist down and I, I think he meant it actually and he grabbed his papers and he went up to the head guy and and was complaining well if you know anything of the history of this you'll know that um fairchild won it they won the competition but unfortunately uh you know we lost they won but that's not the end of the story um the the actual aircraft first flew in in 1985 six months later originally you know proposed well okay so what else is new but unfortunately the cost had increased significantly it was going to cost one and a half million dollars per airplane now it is up to three million dollars and there were some manufacturing problems too the um kind of unfortunate thing in this whole thing was this was fairchild's last gasp now there's a lot of things that go into picking who's going to get to build an aircraft. And not the least one is who needs the business because you need to keep manufacturing capability going in this country. And Fairchild was kind of given the bone. And unfortunately, when it uh, failed, the uh, Republic factory in Farmington, New York, which had been producing aircraft for 60 years, closed. So that was the end of the program. But we're not over yet. Here comes the T-6. Now you're going, wait, that's an old World War II trainer. No, 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 not that T-6. This is the T-6A, the Texan II. This is the one uh, beach program that uh, finally won the program. This aircraft had been um, significantly flight tested and, and was used uh, fairly extensively by other services uh, for training. So this is the aircraft that came into play. And here's the fleet. For the longest time when I was in, they were, gonna, they were saying they're going to have more than one track. You came into the T-37 and you went to the T-38. You may never fly anything as fast or, or as uh, difficult to fly as a T-38. I, I have trouble saying that because I, I think it's a very honest aircraft uh, and not that hard to fly. But then again, I got a lot of time in it. But... If you couldn't hack the 38, even though you may spend your entire life flying essentially a transport aircraft, you were out. If you couldn't hack formation, you were out. And that was a waste of a lot of talent. So they went to the dual track. And now, if you're going to go to fighters, you go to the 38. If you're not going to go to fighters, you go to the, uh, the business aircraft and you get your training in there. So that's the story of why, in my opinion, Cessna did not get the proposal. Thanks for viewing.